in recruiting and preparing candidates to run, from office, run for office from school board all the way up to county recorder. We are thrilled for the first time ever, we have a full slate of candidates running for every countywide position. Yeah. Absolutely. In 2016, we had a total of nine candidates run, six of them won. This time around, we have a candidates for all seven countywide positions, including the first ever primary for the county attorney's race. So please thank, uh, join me in thanking our incredible candidates for stepping up to run for office, all of them. Thank you. We are committed to electing quality candidates who will, help, who will be held accountable to county residents. That's why we're hosting this series. We want to educate the public on how important these countywide races are. These down ballot races impact the lives of our families, friends, and community daily, and we can no longer afford to ignore these races. That's why we ended up with Joe Arpaio running our county jails and have disgraced former state legislator Russell Pierce making a six-figure salary in the county treasurer's office. So thank you all for being here. I want to introduce our executive director, Maritza Miranda Sines. Hello everyone, and like Stephen said, welcome to the first of our three series on how the county government works. We have a list of submitted questions, but if in the middle of all of this you want to submit your own question, please uh, come up and see Brooklyn, and uh, she will have you fill out a card. It is my honor to introduce our moderator for the night, Mary Rose Wilcox. Mary Rose currently serves as the Vice Chair of the Maricopa County Special Health Care Board. She serves Maricopa County District 5 on the board. The Special Health Care Board oversees our public Maricopa County hospitals and health centers. Her leadership on the board as an advocate for our community is just the latest line in her long biography of public service. Mary Rose served on our Phoenix City Council from 1983 to 1993. She served on the County Board of Supervisors from 1993 to 2014, and on both of these, as an elected uh, official, she was the first Latina to serve in that role. While serving on the Board of Supervisors, she was the only Democrat, holding up the needs of her community and maintaining a political position as the sole Democrat is a no easy task. With the foundation she has created, we have on stage today a group of community leaders that hope to serve their communities together. Mary Rose, thank you again for moderating to Come on. Go ahead, Deidre. Thank you again. That's okay. Thank you again for moderating tonight, and I'll let you take over. Thank you very much. And it's very, very exciting to see the Maricopa County Democratic Party getting so involved and hosting these forums because I don't care how many people come, if there's a lot of people, if there's you know not a lot of people, the fact that we're out there and people know that these candidates have such an interest is tremendous. And now with social media, I'm sure Maritza and all her staff will get it all out and people will start keying in and saying, this is something we need to pay attention to. Let me just, before I introduce candidates, say that Maricopa County is extremely important. It's an old territorial type government. And basically, um, you have your row officers, and you'll meet a couple who are running tonight. And they're very important because they have the ability to set their own policy. They have the ability to uh, do what they want with their offices. And the check and balance is the Board of Supervisors who controls the purse strings but it's extremely important. We've seen with Adrian Fuentes how important it is uh, to organize the, the voting elections department under the recorder. Uh, we've seen with the assessor how important it is. And as I introduce our first candidate, I'm going to tell you little stories about uh, the positions because I was there for 22 years and I know how important it is. Uh, Aaron Connor is running for uh, county assessor. Uh, and. <laughs> I've got to tell you that the assessor's office is extremely important. I represented the small town of Guadalupe, and Guadalupe somehow got taxed uh, very, very wrongly. All of their houses were assessed, and nobody could pay the taxes. They went up probably 150%. And I went to the county assessor as a county supervisor, and I said, this is wrong. And you know what they did? We went to town with the software, we went to town, to see in low-income areas, can you do anything different? 
and lo and behold, we were able to find exemptions and the town went back down to what they normally paid. So extremely important to have somebody who has a lot of concern for the community. So Aaron, good luck. Uh, Dan Topori, County Treasurer. And this position is extremely important because they invest the money for the county that comes in. And county has a tremendous amount of money coming in from all the taxation districts. And if the treasurer is not on the ball and invest it right and get the right information out, uh, the county will not get the funds that it needs. And there are so many water districts, there's school districts, the community college board, the special district health board I'm on, and all of those funds that come in from taxpayers um, are left to the county treasurer to do the job that he's supposed to do. And in the past, there were treasurers who just were not very good. So we need to make sure that we keep our eye on the ball there. And the next three positions are board supervisor. Uh, we have uh, Devin Hodge. Okay. We have Deidre uh, Abodi, Abud, and Whitney Walker. And they're representing districts one, two, and three. And believe me, the County Board of Supervisors is only five people, and you control so much uh, policy. You know, you're in charge of the jails, you're in charge of the criminal justice system. They used to be in charge of the county uh, hospital and 14 clinics. But when I was there, we spun that off into a special taxation district because we were no longer mandated for health care. And we knew one day the criminal justice system would steal all the money from the health system. So that's what we did. But these three people will be extremely important uh, because it's not just the rural areas, it's the small towns uh, who they really have a lot of power over. And the big cities, city of Phoenix, city of Glendale, uh, city of Mesa, Scottsdale, the flood control districts, the transportation, we are their partners. And if you don't pay attention, things fall through the cracks there. Uh, and also people try to use the county in a lot of ways that they should not. Um, Ritza was just telling me they passed a uh, resolution that they would honor the Second Amendment. And I have no idea what the hell that means. But you know, I just, that should not even have come through. I know, I got shot there, as you all know. And uh, they need to be careful what they're doing in the community. So all of you, I just wanna say good luck. And why don't we start with Aaron? And I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and then could you introduce yourself and answer a simple question. Uh, what does the office uh, you're, you're doing running for? I've already answered some of it, but if you would do that. Okay. My name is Aaron Connor, and I'm proud to say that I'm the first Democrat to run for this office in four years. So a little bit about me, I'm the son of a police officer who became one of the youngest professors at the University of Illinois. My mom is a nurse, my brother is a commercial lender, and also my sister is a molecular biologist. We're all very, we're, we're, education has played such an important role in our lives, and uh, that's one thing, one of the initiatives that I really want to make sure that gets across is education funding really does begin at the assessor's office because when you think about 75% of your property taxes goes towards education, now more than ever I think we need to have someone that shares our values. Uh, a little bit about my background, uh, I have 16 years of mortgage experience. I've held basically every job within the field. I've worked with assessors most of my professional life. For the last six years I've worked on the software end so I'm like that nerd in the background doing the programming to make the apps look better and make it a little bit more user friendly. So I'm really, really looking forward to bringing those skills into the assessor's office and really adding value to my future bosses, which are all of you. So thank you so much, I appreciate it. Okay, Dan, if you could introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit of Treasure's office. I'm uh, Dan Tafort and I'm running for Maryville County Treasurer. Um, I am a 34-year veteran. Um, I've, I've had a whole lifetime of uh, service to the nation, and I decided uh, instead of uh, going fishing, I decided that there was still some more work that needed to be done, so I decided to look for a public office. And um, the tre somebody uh, suggested I look at the treasurer's office. This is such an important office. This, this office, when run appropriately, will allow us especially, like Mary said, the investment, will allow us, without raising taxes, to fund new schools, to 
to fund roads, to fund all of the things that the county supports. And one of the things that uh, really made me decide that this was a, a wonderful job to, for me to see is that we haven't had great investments. We haven't got somebody who, in, who is the deputy chief treasurer, who is a, primarily a, uh, somebody with a finance background. And so the first thing that I'm gonna do is to get a finance, fire the deputy chief treasurer and get somebody with a finance background. If we were to get on a on 2020, it's a $2.5 billion portfolio. If we were just to get a tenth of a percent yield, that's $2.5 million. That's a whole school that gets fixed that year without raising taxes. And so I'm really looking forward to um, changing the way, instead of customer service, I think the, ta the taxpayers are the boss, and I think that we need to be accountable. And so the way I'm going to be accountable is I'm going to open up the windows, and you'll see uh, everything will be transparent. I will put out things um, that show you where your money's spent, and it will show you the priorities of the people who make those policies. One of the tasks that I believe is really important, the, the treasurer doesn't set the priorities on how to spend the money. Treasurer collects the taxes, pays the bills, and invest the, um, that those funds before they get paid, uh, before they uh, get the, the, the words are written. And the, it's really important right now, we don't have, um, nobody knows who their treasurer is. And that's, that's wrong, you can't be an accountable public servant if you hide in the shadows. So I'm gonna open up the windows, let you see how your $2.5 billion are spent, and that way you can make a priority um, influence on, on the supervisors so that uh, uh, your priorities are matched. We're gonna go down the row, so I'll let uh, Whitney go first. And as you introduce yourself, could you also tell them where your district is, okay? Good evening, everyone. My name is Whitney Walker. I am your candidate for Maricopa County Board of Supervisors and District Attorney. So about me, almost a decade ago, I came here with $687 in my bank account, and my dream was to be the first person in my family to graduate from law school. And I did that successfully. I graduated in the top 10% of my class. But, thank you. Um, but I came here on a mission, and the mission was to bring the, a voice to the voiceless. When I was an undergrad, I had a tra career trajectory with an urban planner, because I always wanted to bring services and, and solutions to my community. However, in July of 2009, my career path took a more uh, deeper turn, because my sister is a survivor of domestic violence. You see, because of that influence and that connection to my sister, I knew that I wanted to do everything in my power to advocate for those who could not advocate for themselves. So since then, that's what I've been doing with my career. Some of my successes have been um, working along with now Senator Kirsten Sinema to make sure that we reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, to expand protections of, for women on tribal lands, to make sure that our communities have resources. And the reason why I'm running to be your County Board of Supervisors in particular, because our current County Board of Supervisors do not uphold the oath that they took to provide services and to protect us. Instead, they're passing resolutions to expand the Second Amendment. Instead of advocating to have common sense, common sense gun uh, protections and ordinances. When we live in a county where we have over 43 cities and towns, it's no reason for a person, regardless of who you love or how you present yourself, that you can still be fired if you don't live in the city or, or work in the cities of Tempe and Phoenix. There is a problem and I'm running not only for what I can do today and tomorrow, but what would our regional look, leadership look like 10 years from now. I'm running to make sure that everyone in District 3, regardless of your zip code, your circumstance, or who you decide to love, you will have a relentless advocate there on your side. Do you want to just geographically tell them where District is, or where District is? Okay. So District 3, thank you. <laughs> District 3 is Central Phoenix, goes all the way to Northern Phoenix, all the way up to Anthem. It goes everything west of Scottsdale Road and Scottsdale. So if you live in those areas, and down to legislative districts, District LD24, District LD30, two precincts in District LD23, District 20, District, all of District 28, and parts of District 1. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Hodge. Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Great. Love it. 
My name is Kevin Hodge, and it is my honor to be with you all today. I first want to thank you uh, for coming out uh, and listening to each and every one of us today and listening to what we uh, have to discuss. I want to thank the viewers online for viewing and, and participating and doing your civic duty. I also would like to take a point of personal privilege to elect, recognize elected officials in the room. Bernetta Hodge, the president of the Tempe Union High School District of the Board. Thank you for joining us today and introducing myself. My name is Jevin Hodge, and I am running to be your representative of District 1. District 1 is South Scottsdale, so just literally, we're three blocks outside of District here. South Scottsdale, everything south of McDowell, all of Tempe, West Mesa, west of Arizona Avenue, our country club, Ahwatukee, Chandler, Gilbert, and Queen Creek, and everything in Gilbert that is south of Elliott. So the 12 precincts above Elliott and LD12 are not in it. So it's a, it's, it's a vast, Dense 768,814 residents in the Southeast Valley. I'm running to be a representative. I'm running to be a voice, to be an advocate. District, the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, and we have a living legend with us to here today, is the meat and potatoes of politics, is the meat and potatoes of government engagement. We, they manage a $2.5 billion budget that impacts policy in every space of your life, from the, the air that you're breathing, to the roads that you drive on, to the buildings that you work in, to the schools that you're educated in, the homes that you live in, the water in your pipes, the pipes that carry that water, and everything else that you can think of. The Board of Supervisors, in some way, shape, or form, impacts your everyday life. And I'm willing to be an ambassador and an advocate for the residents of Maricopa County. People do not know this is the most important position in local government that you know absolutely nothing about. And that is not by mistake. It's because the, the lack of accountability in this space of government is so that the individuals on this board can do what they want to do with your tax dollars and not represent your interests. I'm the president of the longest running Head Start facility in the state of Arizona, the Booker T. Washington Child Development Center, and I had the distinctive honor to represent all 1.2 million Democrats as the vice chairman. When, and while I was the vice chairman, I was the youngest statewide African American Democratic official in the United States of America. So when it comes to being an ambassador, it comes to having someone representing your interests, I am your man. Thank you very much for your time today. I truly appreciate it. I'm Deidre Boone and I'm running in District 2. District 2 is basically Cave Creek and Fountain Hills, Scottsdale East of Scottsdale Road, most of Mesa and a tiny little bit of Gilbert, all, basically all the way down to Williamsfield Airport. It is the second largest district. Um, it is 13, or 1,600 miles, almost a million people, and no Democrat has run in this office for eight years, uh, so my opponent is extremely um, un used to having an opponent, so we're coming as a surprise. Um, the, the board is, uh, uh, I am an attorney. One of the reasons why I wanted to run for this office, besides having spent many years at the Board of Supervisors meetings and talking about what they're ignoring, I also am very upset about the many millions of dollars in fines and defense fees that the Board of Supervisors keeps paying. So we've paid over $10 million uh, because of our PIO lawsuits. We've paid several million dollars because of county attorney ethics, defense, and fines. And we might even have some lawsuits coming out of the assessor's office because the assessor got indicted in three states, 62 counts of human trafficking and Medicaid fraud. So, you know, <laughs> well, yeah, just little things. Um, but, uh, I'm an attorney and I feel like that when the community and when employees come to the Board of Supervisors and says, these are problems that are going on, that we can go in and set some policies that redirect and, and have these violations not happen. So even if we were to be sued, we would have a defense because we took action. The Maricopa County Board of Supervisors is over 60 departments. If you look on the website, you just didn't even know all these departments existed. It's absolutely, as Jevin said, everything down the line that you can imagine that affects your daily life. And I just wanna set a little standard here that Jevin, Whitney, and I are running in different districts for the same office and we communicate and we know, I, actually, I am only going to speak for myself. I know what they stand for. I know the policies that they're pushing. I agree with everything that they're saying. So as we're talking in order to save time, I'm just gonna say ditto 
and talk about something other than what they talked about because there's a lot. And this is a crash course because most people didn't even know that this office existed. So now, and even the districts, like people say, I'm in Congressional District 5. I, yeah, that's congressional, and then you have a legislative, and now I'm going to county at you. <laughs> so that's really about me. We're going to uh, start with Deidre again, and I'm going to uh, go down and ask questions. Uh, Deidre, you mentioned it. What are some overlooked county departments that voters should know more about? Give us a couple. So, one of the, uh, here's some homework. Um, <laughs> Google Maricopa County Board of Supervisors or just Maricopa County plus sign education. And you will find that the, the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors has never mentioned this word. In, in all of the red frets, they've never mentioned this word. And yet, it is a part of the budget. If you go, if you, if you check on Department of Education for the county, it'll take you to, it's supposed to be the superintendent of public instruction, but he calls it the superintendent of schools, so you're already confused. And then he talks a lot about homeschooling and private schooling, um, very little about public schooling. But what I really want you to understand is the Board of Supervisors is, they weren't even part of the conversation that education was part of Maricopa County and that Maricopa County could also have been involved in Red for Ed. They didn't get the pushback that the state legislature had. And it was a very important department. Uh, animal care and control, uh, correctional health, another three million dollar fines in correctional health. The, several of the administrators have been, become draconian in the assessor's office now, but it, was, it started off in the uh, animal control where they had employees telling on each other to the administrator. The administrator had a rule that you weren't allowed to talk anything bad about the entire department, even among yourselves. And they started warning people and terminating people over it, over private, conversations with a co-worker about things they were dissatisfied with. So these are some problems. Mm -hmm. A question for you, it's two and a half minutes. Okay. Uh, 2.5 billion dollars, how would you prioritize? It's a great question. Number one, listening. 2.5 billion dollar budget. So when you think about it, you put that into perspective. 2.5 billion dollars for 4.4 million people at the state level. That's a 7. Point billion, 7.5 billion dollar budget for 9.5 billion dollar budget for 7.2 million people. So when you think about the magnitude of the impact and scope of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, it's incredibly significant. And how you prioritize a $2.5 billion budget is listening to the needs of your residents and your constituents, listening to the partners and stakeholders in the county, the nonprofits, the business community, and the folks that are investing in our residents. Listening first and foremost, and that's something that's not being done. You start by prioritizing the uh, essentials, right? You funding you know, the key programs and making sure that we are investing in our infrastructure and investing in our employees and providing a safe, healthy work environment for our county employees and, and so that they can fulfill the needs for all of our residents, but making sure that we are ensuring that there is an outlet for all county uh, stakeholders to participate in the budgeting process, to provide their voice, to provide their input. Okay, would there be any um, prioritization as far as the budget? what you would go in and try to get more money for? Yes, that's a great question. That's a great question. Yes, yes, yes. So we are on the brink of a homelessness crisis right now. Um, and each of our cities are experiencing um, a dramatic increase of, of, of homelessness and, and residents in Maricopa County that are experiencing homelessness. For me, prioritizing serving as the quarterback of this issue, right? The county can come in to facilitate the, the, the conversations amongst the cities and, and even down to the school districts that are handling, the nonprofits that are handling this issue. But we need to make sure that we're prioritizing addressing these needs and that would be first and foremost one of the key issues that I would put first. Uh, how would you work with the departments overseen by the Board of Supervisors, particularly air quality and environmental services? How, how I would work with these departments is first um, listening to employees as well. 
Um, I think it's very critical that we um, acknowledge the hard work that our county employees are already doing, um, and we support their efforts in what they're doing. Um, but as a visionary and as a leader of the board, um, reaching out to various different nonprofits that's doing that are already doing the work, but also making sure that we're meeting the standards, not at a bare minimum, but focusing on what we need to do to get to where we need, where we need to go. Some of the things that I have in um, in mind and, and part of my equity agenda that will be released on my website is making sure that we're going to once again every zip code and making sure we're having these listening sessions around the county and not in a way where we're just benefiting the current de de redevelopers that are coming to Maricopa County and putting their needs first. Um, in my district alone, we have some of the highest rates of kids experiencing asthma. Um, and unfortunately, in Maricopa County, that shouldn't be the case. I will look into opportunities where we can reinvest our county budget um, into programs and, to, and into things that actually benefit the community. But I also want to stress that we have some very hardworking county employees that need good leadership at the County Board of Supervisors that will provide transparency, that will provide pro uh, support, so we all can work together on this issue. Okay, so Dan. Okay. Dan, as treasurer, how do you plan to educate residents of Maricopa County on how their tax dollars are spent? Yeah, I think that's uh, something that um, has not been done very well up to this point. It's really important that you see those priorities. If we need to make simple um, information go out to you, we don't have to have things 15 clicks down on a web page or a 400 feet, uh, page PDF. We need to have the information go out. We spend 52%, a little bit more than 52% of our uh, county budget on public safety. Jails, courts, the sheriff's office. We spend an eighth of a percent, of eight tenths of a percent on education. Eight tenths of a percent. If, when people see those sorts of things, so we'll put that out. Um, one of the advantages of being somebody who doesn't do the priorities, I, I feel it's my obligation and my responsibility to let the people know if, if their priorities are being met. And so we would put out, we'll, we'll clean up the website, we'll make it uh, easy, uh, we'll have systems, uh, we'll modernize uh, the way that we communicate. Um, right now, the uh, computer systems in the treasurer's office, have, have, they, they spent a lot of money to get a really bad system. Um, I'll go, I'll advocate with the, uh, the board of supervisors to say, look, they wasted some money, I understand, but we'll have to get that back because it's really your information. If you don't have op the opportunity to go to your information system, you can't hold the people resp uh, responsible and accountable for your money. And so I, I, I think that uh, outreach, one of the things that I don't want to do is I don't want to wait for you to come and ask me a question. I want to be asking you questions. I want to be listening to what uh, people have to say. Aaron, as a future county assessor, uh, if I don't home or pay property taxes, why is this race important? That's a great question, by the way. And the thing that I default to, and I'm hearing it from all these fine folks, uh, is that education is so important. And again, I can only reiterate this so many times that 75% of your property taxes goes directly towards education. So you want to make sure that your impact, you're, you're maximizing the revenue that you're getting from the county by minimizing the, the effect on the entire populace. You, you mentioned Guadalupe. There, the way that we will assess your property is a method called full cash valuations. Did you know that Guadalupe's uh, full cash valuations in 2019 rose 27% last year? I did. Yeah. I, I wasn't there to protect them. I know. <laughs> well, we will be there uh, to protect them. And it's those underserved communities that are really getting beat up and bullied that it, it, it's time that we all pay our fair share. So Guadalupe's went up 27%, while Carefree's only went up 1.5%. So I now know why they call it Carefree. But yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of making sure that we have an educated Arizona, and I think even if you're not a property owner, you can get behind that. All right, I'm going to let each of you address how would you communicate with your constituents? Uh, it's really important 
uh, because the county is you're really large. When you, it's the largest landmass county in the United States. So how would you communicate with your residents? Is that for me? For all of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing, is, and uh, transparency is of vital importance, especially for the assessor's office. How many people, by a show of hands, knows who the current assessor is? So the current assessor is the unindicted one. So Paul Peterson has resigned. Uh, the Board of Supervisors have put in a, a man by the name of Eddie Cook. And the fact that you don't know that the name of the, the assessor, that's part of the problem there. So my my goal is for the first term, for the first year of my term, I will go to every major city and hold town halls just like this to educate people about why the assessment process is so important. And then every week I will do a, I'm a huge FDR fan, I'm gonna do a fireside chat that you'll be able to see online every week. Uh, so that's the way that I'm gonna communicate what the assessor's office is gonna be doing. It's all about transparency, it's very, very important. One of, one of the things that really uh, made me decide to run was uh, when I did some research on who the uh, county treasurer is right now. Um, the only interview that I really found was an interview where he said he doesn't do interviews. He was literally telling a reporter he doesn't talk to the press. They just get it wrong and then it's fake news. I believe that it's my responsibility to talk to the, the taxpayer because you're not my customer, you're my boss. And so one of the things that I would do is I will talk to the press. And if they do get it wrong, which I, they probably didn't, but if they do get it wrong, then it's my responsibility to correct it. Because I have to let you know what's happening with your money. This, this is uh, critical. I know that there's lots of uh, venues that we don't use. Uh, there's television, right? Sunday mornings, people who are interested in politics can watch us on the local programs. I'll, I'll do whatever it, it takes. Website, we can do uh, social media. There's lots of different ways that we can uh, communicate with the taxpayer. And I think one of the problems that we've had in this county governance where they've had um, the sole party in power for so long is that they haven't seen a need to innovate. They've been doing the same thing that they've been doing for 30 years. And that it's time to change. Um, how many people here use Facebook? How many people here um, have uh, other um, instant uh, communication with their phones? We can do that. And we need to be looking for innovative ways, particularly to communicate. Ms. Walker. Well, um, just to echo what my colleague said up here, I will host uh, town halls. But I also want to make sure that um, the people of District 3 know that they have an ally and advocate for them at the county board. So some of the things that I will uh, try to uh, um, propose is making sure that we have more boards and commissions to reflect the need that is currently happening here in Maricopa County, but not only what's currently happening here in Maricopa County, but looking to the future. What would Maricopa County need four years from now? What would Maricopa County need 10 years from now? And I think this will give a great opportunity for the people of District 3 and for the people of Maricopa County to be involved in the process. Currently, Maricopa County Board of Supervisors do not have a women's commission. So we have so many things that's going on that affects women that I think we have some really great, strong allies, even here in this audience, that will be more than willing to serve and help us um, and help us create this vision where a Maricopa County can work for all people. So those are some of the things that I have um, proposed in my upcoming agenda to make sure that this is a Maricopa County that includes everyone. Quality stakeholder engagement starts by meeting your residents where they are. And so, yes, the town halls, yes, we will make sure that everyone's invited and they have the, the email communications and the text communications and, 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 and the website updates. But also, in addition to that, we're gonna do, in our office, we're gonna go above and beyond to meet our residents where they are. That's the Twitter town halls, right? From the comfort of your home, we will be live from X amount of time so that you can have the conversation with us online, in public. Facebook live town halls so folks can have those conversations. Community roadshow meetings, going to those boys and girls clubs and meeting the parents where they are and the nonprofits and extending, you know, if anyone invites us to come to a board meeting, come to a community fair, come to
to a community session, being there and being present. Because if we can't prioritize the needs of our residents, if we're not listening to them, and that starts by meeting them where they are. Everyone doesn't want to go to a town hall. Everyone doesn't want to tweet. But we, being creative and being innovative with our solutions and, and identifying creative pathways to ensure that every person has a voice in the giving process. So ditto. <laughs> um, communication requires more than sitting behind your desk sending an email. And that is currently what our board of supervisors does. They have over 13,000 employees who have never met them. Never met them. When the assessor's office, when the assessor got indicted and finally got removed, actually he had to resign because they were unable to figure out if they could remove him, the one of the board of supervisors, Whitney's opponent actually, went into the assessor's office and said, we're gonna be great, we're gonna be fine, just do your job, and left. That's the first time they ever met the man. That's a problem, which by the way, there's five men on the board. Um, the other thing is, yes, I agree with the town halls and all of this, and this, these are very important. Maricopa County meets in downtown Phoenix at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday. That is not accessible. Yes, they have a, a web link that's kind of iffy sometimes, but quarterly, do you know how big Maricopa County is? Quarterly, they should be meeting, why can't we have rotating? Satellite, go around. Come to me, us, come to you, to come to us, especially to downtown Phoenix on a Wednesday at 10 a.m. I don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. Although I'm applying for a job, so I can every day. But people, it's so difficult. These are the kind of things that we need to do. People, not only do they not know about the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, they don't know who their supervisor is. They literally don't get out. If they don't even get out and meet their employees, are you thinking that they're really getting out and meeting their constituents? And as far as social media, I totally agree with that. Anybody who follows me knows that my entire life is online <laughs> on every single platform, including TikTok. I believe in transparency. I believe in, in using the format exactly as Adrian Fontes, our wonderful Maricopa County recorder, uses social media to engage the population about their right to vote. And that's what we should be doing in every single office, including the Board of Supervisors. The idea about the meetings is really, really uh, important. Um, I was on that board for 22 years, and I practically had to just have the meetings by myself in order to shame people into going to other parts of the county. So that, that's really important. Okay, Mr. Assessor, uh, how will you ensure all county residents are assessed properly and equally? You've uh, answered a little bit of that, but could you expand? Absolutely. I'm, it, I'm gonna do a radical thing. I'm actually gonna have humans assess property because right now your property is being assessed by an aircraft That's true. and the aircraft doesn't realize what's living space so right now you're being taxed on your garage as if you live there so the current assessor's office is 40 assessors short uh, they have never rehired all the retirees and actually they're going to be a probably around 80 or 90 short after the next two years because of all the people that are looking to retire. And it, it starts with actual human people going out there and assessing property. Uh, so day one, I'm going to be launching probably one of the biggest adult uh, adult uh, job fairs to get quality, and these are quality jobs. Assessors can do this for the rest of their life. So I definitely want to talk to displaced workers and because I myself has been a displaced worker, I survived the tech bubble in the 1990s and the mortgage crisis in 2008. So I know a lot about retooling and I wanna be there to help other people retool and that's that's just job one for me is to actually get humans to assess property. Mr. Treasurer, how do you plan on being more accountable to community members? Well, accountability is everything. Um, I believe that you have to know who I am. And that means I have to communicate with you. I have to show you what I'm doing. And uh, we have to assess the communications process. Uh, not only just uh, accountable in the regards to how I do the job. There's a, whenever you have a, a big task, in the, the treasurer's office by the county's uh, state, small office, 70-ish 70 70 uh, employees, 
One of the things that we need to do is we really need to change the way they look at how they do business. Um, they have a, a, great, a great staff, but they have been led in a way that allows them to treat everybody as customers. And that isn't, uh, like I said earlier, that isn't how, you, how we uh, treat uh, taxpayers. Taxpayers are the boss. That's why you can fire me in four years if I don't do a good job. So one of the things that I will do is open up the windows to let you see. Uh, we'll put out lots of different information. Some people like things in, on a one sheet page. Some people like information in a 400 page document. We'll put up different formats so that people can see what, what is going on in, and they can pick and choose the way that they want to see it. Okay, the next question I'm going to ask that, um, the three members who are vying for board supervisors uh, answer. And this is a really important one. Uh, we all know that we're probably in the middle of a health crisis, if um, not now, very shortly. How will you improve access to health care services for Arizona's growing and increasingly diverse population, including senior citizens? Whitney? Thank you for your question. Uh, on average, Arizona owns dollars per person. Um, when it comes to public health and health service needs. Coming from a health and human service background, I know that we are stronger when we have a coordinated campaign that includes all partners, that includes people that are actually on the ground doing the work, that means the worker, that includes our nonprofit agencies that are actually um, putting together coalitions to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the people in the most vulnerable population. This includes making sure that we have a Maricopa County government that is working with everyone involved. A part of um, my vision is making sure that we increase funding for uh, Maricopa County as a whole to make sure that you don't have any barriers to, to seek this access, whether it's getting dental work, whether it's just getting a checkup, or whether it's a life-altering health condition that may put you out of work. Um, Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, first and foremost, are supposed to provide the services and the safety that's needed in our communities. So what I am proposing as the County Board of Supervisors is that we're redefining what safety looks like. 60% of the County Board of Supervisors budget goes to law, law enforcement and goes to county prosecution office, offices. And these services are very needed to make sure that our county is safe. However, safety also looks like making sure that someone is, whether they're eight years old or whether they're 80 years old, they have glasses to see. So I believe that once we put money behind the County Board of Supervisors Public Health Department, everyone will have access. But also this includes making sure that we have people at the table, all stakeholders involved to make sure this access is inclusive and is accessible for everyone. To piggyback my colleague here, ditto. <laughs> you, they say, show us your budget and we'll show you your priorities. And that's, that's plain and simple here. And so identifying where can we trim the fat, right? Because if you look at the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors budget, you'll see five, six, seven times over the same budget being submitted by 60 plus departments. So that means holding you know, each of the department heads, the, the county manager accountable to make sure that we are auditing and, 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 and reinventing what our budget priorities are and then reallocating to where we need to be reallocating towards. Our health and human services department, we need more doctors, we need more nurses, we need more nurse and patient ambassadors, we need more advocates that are doing this work so that we can provide comprehensive uh, uh, comprehensive services and wraparound services. In addition to that, the County Board of Supervisors, it, this role, you're a broker of big ideas. You take in what you hear from the community and you translate that to the folks that are implementing the action. So identifying how can you bring in individuals at the school district level, in the nonprofit sector, even in the for-profit sector, to ensure that we can have those innovative and creative partnerships where we can provide those services. Identifying what nonprofits are already providing, you know, the 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 distribution of, of medical materials and, and how can the county come in to support those efforts with a, 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 a practitioner, right, so that we can provide on-site 
uh, comprehensive medical care, right? And, and it's not just at the, 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 the regional hubs, right? And identifying how can we bring those stakeholders together to the table. So at the end of the day, accountability uh, is at, at the core of everything that we need to be doing in the reallocation of funds to support our health and human services department. We do have the, the regional facilities, but not all the regional facilities do all of the things that the county board or the county health department could. Um, so you have to navigate, first of all, just to know there's a health department on the county level. Then you have to navigate what services do they provide. Then you have to navigate which of the regional locations provide them. I think one of the huge gaps that we could fill on the county level, why don't we have mobile units? You know, we can have mobile units with some of the testing, some of the services, not everything, but some of the things that are very much more needed, and, and send those to places like Sun City or West or East Mesa or you know Gilbert. You know, some of these places that, that it's too difficult for people to come all the way toward Phoenix to find a regional center that can provide the services that they just now found out that they could actually get from the county. So Mobile units are used for, for gathering blood, for um, testing different things. This is not something outside the realm of possibilities of a budget, but this is something that would make sure that people, especially in rural areas, had the actual access so that we could serve them, which is what we're supposed to be doing with their tax dollars. That's a novel idea. <laughs> okay, uh, we've heard from uh, the three supervisors, the assessor, and the treasurer, and I think they bring really fresh ideas. Uh, the, the county for too long has been one that is controlled, quite frankly, by Republicans who don't reach out the way they should. And I think if we got any of these people elected, and I hope we do, uh, we will see a different kind of board. So good luck, all of you. Uh, we are going to have closing, but before we do, is there a burning question from anybody out there? Feel free. Questions that you didn't know you had. <laughs> yes, sir. I came from out of state, so I'm just stupid, but um, you said there are 60 departments that the six or 60 plus. Yes. Who appoints the heads of those departments? All right, okay. And um, do they have a process? I would say both. Yes, they, they they put out that they have a job opening, but too often you can you could actually f draw the lines between who knew who to get what. Very true. Um, and also, too, there's a lack of accountability on that end as well, because a lot of the department heads um, do not go through you know employee evaluations and these type of things where. Um, a lot of lower level employees that have worked really hard and very committed to serving all of us are not getting their due diligence um, at the county level. So that's another disservice that if you had a change in, you know, the overall vision for Maricopa County that this can, you know, make sure that all workers have um, a right, you know, have dignity at the workplace too. Okay, just a little bit on that. Uh, they do have a website that you can, you know, access jobs, but it is a good old boy system many times, as Ms. Walker said, so that needs to be uh, really opened up. Yes, ma'am. There's some implied tasks that, uh, at least in the treasurer's office, that haven't been fulfilled. No other office in the county has the totality of the budget within their purview. I, I will see everything that's paid for, and I will be able to look at uh, 
of how those 60 different organizations do things. And I will be able to see how we can get uh, value out of uh, taking good ideas from one or the other. I think that it's really important that any elected official is an advocate for important uh, change. Um, there's a reason why they don't have the treasurer, the assessor, as a, you know, a hired person that just comes in as a civil servant. Having an elected person makes sure that they are accountable to the people's needs. And that's, that, that, that's, that's the critical starting point. What about the fact that um, there are no, hardly any uh, Democrats? Well, I, I will tell you, um, there are very few Democrats uh, in all of these positions. And so they're not looking for different innovative ways to do things. I know that the, the county pays more than $20 million a year for electricity. Why not ask the question, why doesn't the county make an investment in their own uh, renewable energy source? Why, why not look at, see, um, that uh, we, we spend right now, because of the way that they invest money, in the most expensive kind of health care, emergency room, basically. I bet that if we were to ask the questions, we could find innovative ways to save people money and increase um, health care increase, uh, if, if we built a solar farm, at some point it would be pay, it would pay for itself. Those are the sorts of things that we need to do. And as the treasurer who's looking to save people's money so that they can, the priorities can be met, um, I think it's really important that you get a Democrat who's not gonna discount um, science, who's not going to discount uh, everybody's right to be respected. Aaron? For me, what it comes down to is values. And when you think about what the current Republican Party stands for, it isn't middle class workers like you and I. They're definitely not even concerned about it. I hear stories about people being, being thrown out of their homes due to unfair and biased assessments, and that will end day one. Why? I'm a Democrat. I believe in empathy. And I think that that's something that's lacking in all levels of government nowadays. You have to actually put not only your head, but your heart into your job as well. Um, I'm such a bleeding heart that I need an ID to vote. So it, <laughs> it, it works out really well. But it comes down to values. And are, do you want your values to be represented or someone else's? And that's why I think it's important to be a Democrat. I think it's just echoing um, what my colleague said, and I'm sure uh, what Deidre and Jevin will say as well. It comes down to values, um, making sure that everybody has opportunity and access to get the services that they need so they can thrive regardless of their zip code, regardless of where they live or the circumstance that they're in. Um, and for so long, it's been such a good old boys club. And it's been um, lack of accountability among peers, a lack of accountability among the people that elect them. And so now it's time to make sure that we have representation that will put the people first. And that is what Democrats, we all do. And it's very important to make sure that the gains that we have won in 2016, 2018, that we don't continue to fall back. So now it's time to change and we can do it if we, you know, all come together. Now we're, we're repeating the wheel here. It's putting people first. And that sounds like a, a difficult concept if you look at our current state of local government, you look at our, what's happening right now in the country. But at our core, it's important to have a Democrat in this position because Democrats are gonna put people first and provide the needed values and, and, and protections that are needed so that you can grow uh, healthy, so you have sustainable, you know, reliable energy and, and you have a future to look forward to so that we have the planning that's in place for our kids Kids, 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 kids. I think it's important for Democrats to be in these offices because Democrats respond to criticism. Democrats get out into the community. They listen to people. They have to respond when people are criticizing what's going on in the government, even if it's not their office. Whereas the Republicans, I never see them out there. I'm at just about every event. I literally, there's a hashtag, Deidre is everywhere. Because I go everywhere, not just to Democratic events. And I can't find a Republican representative in the state of Arizona to save my life. But I find I'm tripping over Democrats everywhere. Okay. Well
why don't we go ahead then? And you have one question? Go ahead. She's asking, she says that uh, Maricopa County's borders are overlaid with the uh, Native American communities. And how would you work with them? That's what you're asking, isn't it? Okay. So one, the, the largest community is, is within my district too, in the, the Honda area and um, the precinct. And one of the things is we're really trying to get out there, myself, as well as the people running for state representation. So we're trying to engage them where they are. Right? Not with the expectation that they owe us anything, that they need to vote because we're trying to protect them. No, it's like, we're here, what do you need from us for a change? Um, so one is just engagement, it, it respecting that, that some of them are so turned off by the neglect and the taking advantage of them that has been going on and not recognizing the importance of their borders, their traditions, their laws, we have to understand them. So I actually work with a, uh, an attorney that uh, she works on Native American issues. So she's one of the people that can advise me on questions and then also um, some of the, the Native American tribes were actually, I had several people on my campaign in my last campaign, so you know, keeping up with that, but also recognizing that Everybody's, as many communities, everybody's not the same. So we have to meet people where they are and see what we can do for them where they are, and they owe us nothing. Okay. Uh, we're going to, did you want that question? Or? Okay, okay, we're gonna have the closing remarks, but just a little bit on that. Um, why it's so important to have Democrats on. When um, I was on the board, there weren't any other Democrats, and it was very hard to get people committed to committees and we finally shamed our board into getting a person from Salt River, a person from Gila, into our transportation board, into our flood control board, because those issues are everybody's issues. They're not D or R's, but it's very, very hard. So I, I look forward to the day when we can have three new Democrats on there, change the whole complexion. Okay. So why don't we go ahead with closing remarks. We'll start with Deidre and go on down. And if you would take one or two minutes and just persuade these people why they got to get out and work for you and why you need to win. So first you can follow me on any social media platform. It's all uniform at Deidre number four boss with one S. Um, I, I want to actually use my time to reframe something. So this resolution that everybody's been saying it's to, to protect the, the Second Amendment. That's actually not what it is. So let me tell you what it is. It, well, they said we have a resolution, and in this resolution, we will not use any county resources or allow the enforcement of any federal or state law that we, unidentified board of supervisors, deems unconstitutional it, or violating individual rights, comma, including Second Amendment. And before they had that vote, they had a vote not to allow public comments. Which, so they passed a resolution to protect First Amendment rights and the Constitution while violating the First Amendment. So this was not, we should not be framing this as a protect Second Amendment. This was a, I'm going to violate the amendments that I choose to violate while passing a resolution saying that I'm not going to allow anybody else to violate, comma, including Second Amendment. Yeah. And that's what happens when folks do not know about what's happening in their local government. And that is why it's so important to elect each and every person on this stage that's going to restore accountability, that's going to provide access and opportunity, and it's going to make sure that the everyday resident, every resident, every stakeholder has a voice in the process. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask that you get out and support, not just me, but support everyone on this stage whether it's with a, a simple $5 contribution, a signature to qualify them for the ballot, a volunteer hour to knock some doors and make some phone calls, it's so vitally important. And the thing is, you hear every election, this is the most important election of your lifetime. Let me tell you the truth. It is the most important election of your lifetime because every election is the most important election of your life.
lifetime. And now that you know just a little bit more about this space of government, how 4.4 million residents in Maricopa County are impacted by $2.5 billion budgets, you see why it's so important to have representatives that are gonna put people first. So if you wanna get involved in our movement, if you wanna get involved in any of the other movements, look behind you. You have representatives from each of the tables. Go sign up, grab a donation envelope for myself and my colleagues here because it takes, we need some fuel in the gas tank to keep the movements alive. So thank you so much again for your time. You're here on, I don't even know what day of the week it is anymore, evening, and you're spending your afternoon with us and everyone online. Thank you for participating and chiming in and watching us because your time is valuable and we appreciate you spending it with us. and your tenacity to be for everyone. We need to make sure that we have a county board of supervisors that will approve budgets to expand to make sure that we have people, real people, assessing homes. We need to make sure we have a county board of supervisors that when we're talking about true restorative justice and criminal justice reform, that we have a county board of supervisors that's gonna support that county attorney. We need a county board of supervisors that when we have a Democrat county treasurer coming forth to bring transparency and innovation to you, for you to know where your tax dollars are being spent, you need a county board of supervisors to approve that budget. We are all working together to make sure that you and the people win for Maricopa County. It's 4.4 million people here in Maricopa County and all they need is access and all they need is opportunity. We all have literature and information in the back and what we will ask of you for, for us to earn your vote is for you sign our petitions, for you to donate your, your Starbucks allowance <laughs> to us, and for you just to and be invested in the vision that we have, and for you to work with us to make sure that we have a miracle that moves forward and not backwards. I am passionate about two things. One, keeping people in homes and helping them get homes. And that spirit and that passion will guide me in every decision that I make. When you think about the Maricopa County Assessor's Office, it's 1.8 million parcels with a property valuation of $607 billion. So my, my, major, my major goal is to use that empathy uh, with every decision I make. Uh, if fairness and transparency is something that is important to you, if funding education is important to you, I definitely encourage you to join us. Volunteer and donate at Connor2020.com. Donate to all these incredible, I am so humbled to be part of it and sharing the same stage with each and every one of you. Uh, I think it's time to have an assessor that not only values property, but also the people that live in them. Thank you so much. The county treasurer is a job of special trust. It's your money. Somebody literally handling your money. You don't have a choice, you have to contribute. It matters that the, you have a person in, that does that that you can trust. You do not want to have somebody who is gonna hire their best friend, who's toxic on his own, to come in and uh, cheat you of the investments that you deserve. You don't want somebody to come in who's going to try to make money off of other people's, in the assessor's office, trafficking humans. You don't want people who are going to disregard the voice of the people. It's really important that you pick people that you trust. And that is one of the things that you can, this, this panel right here, has. We, we are all people that have worked our lives in jobs that uh, demonstrated the amount of trust that you can have in us. Um, not one of us has uh, made a, a bazillion dollars uh, with a charter school. Not one of us has uh, been uh, human trafficking. Not one of us is willing to do anything other than what's best for the people. And that's what it really matters. These jobs matter because these are your roads, these are your schools, these are your kids' lives and your kids' future. Whether it's uh, taxes, whether it's how your home is valued, whether it's the priorities on what the county spends, they need to reflect what your value is. And that's why it's very important for you to support all of us. We don't want 
the state legislature to turn blue, the Senate to turn blue, and then a bunch of Republicans in the county uh, governance taking every positive gain that we make to court and delaying progress at your own expense. We want people that are gonna support the positive change that everybody has said it's time for. Well, we'd like to thank these candidates. And from a person who served 22 years on that board, I hope you all get elected. <laughs> we, they need you. Uh, it was good old boy system, and we had to rail at it to make any changes. And you can make changes, they're big ones. But good luck to all of you. Let's give them another round of applause. And let's really give the Maricopa County uh, Democratic Party a big round of applause for putting on the forum. Okay. We're going to have our chairman close out. All right. Again, thank you everybody for coming here tonight. We really greatly appreciate it. Let's get up for Mary Rose for everything that she's doing and everything. And also all of our wonderful candidates one more time. Let's get all of them elected. I want to introduce one more per, uh, candidate who just walked in, uh, candidate for county attorney, Tamika Wooten, over here. Uh, just real quick, our staff, Laura Koppel, our field director, Adder Diaz Martinez Communications in Brooklyn Sunset over here. Thank you for everything that you do. Um, we're just going to thank one more time. If you guys could come up here, we're going to take a photo of you guys. And please stick around, come meet all of our candidates, and thank you guys again for coming tonight. Thank you.